Well, we were in uh, kind of going into the first first uh, pillar, easy runs. Mm. Spent some time with uh, Allison at Run Lab this past weekend. She's amazing. She was great. Yeah. And one of the kind of metaphors she talked about was that if you think of your easy aerobic base building runs, which are below max aerobic heart rate. Mm -hmm. And we can talk about how to identify max aerobic heart rate and, and what zone you should be running at, what paces and what efforts. But if you think of your aerobic base building, easy runs as your foundation, mm -hmm. they're essential. You can't do anything without a foundation. And the speed workouts, these are the houses you build on top of that foundation. A lot of people think that if you want to run faster or harder, quote unquote, you just, you need to add more speed in. You need to go right to the track and start doing some intervals and some repeats. And I think what we found and I specifically have found is that when you start logging more volume, you start adding these slow runs in, you build this aerobic base, that is your engine. And what are we trying to do with an engine? We're trying to make it more efficient. That is like the first step for me at least is, hey, let's run slower below our max aerobic heart rate, start increasing volume and start becoming a better, more efficient runner. Yes. I think that one of the things that's lost on so many people, and it was lost on me for years, is the importance of running easy and not deluding ourselves into believing that uh, something faster than easy is actually easy. Um, I hit on this back in our last podcast where we are products of an American high school system products of the American university system where I think a lot of times the easy runs are too hard. We run too fast and we have ourselves in a constant state of distress neurologically. I feel like that we walk around with way, way too much cortisol coursing through our bodies and that makes us tired. That makes us lethargic. We um, have this uh, work ethic in America that I think is absolutely um, to be celebrated. We love hard work. We respect hard work. And um, if we don't, we should. But what happens is then is we believe that progress is linear. And I think that you can say after your experiences in building this company, BPN, that the progress has not always been linear, right? It doesn't go from the bottom left to the top right in a nice straight line straight up every day, right? Now, you're striving to get 1% better every day, but that 1% doesn't necessarily actually mean you're going to get 1% faster every day. 1% better in the distance running world can mean, did I get better at recovery? Did I get better at nutrition? Did I get better at the mental aspects of this sport. But what we can't fall prey to is running our easy runs too fast, right? Because when we do that, we induce a massive amount of stress on a day-to-day -day basis that becomes cumulative. And then when it's time to run hard, our bodies are tired and that we do not maximize physiologically the gains that we have the chance to make on our specific hard days because our easy days have been something faster than easy. Uh, and that's a real danger that I think the driven athlete falls prey to. And I think that you've probably done some of that in the past too. And I think you hit on that as I, well in the uh, last podcast. I was horrible with it. Yeah. I mean, when I started training for my actually, I, I call it my first marathon, my, my first two marathons, it was, I'm going to go out there and I'm just going to complete them. They were slog fests. It sucked. It, <laughs> it was slogged them. You I was run. <laughs> I was thinking about this the other day, actually, when I was training for those two marathons, one, I had no plan. I had no structure. Yeah. I just went out and ran however far I wanted to. Right. But I wasn't even tracking mileage or pace. Like, I didn't have a Garmin. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't have a smartwatch. I wore a, a, a G-Shock watch from when I was in the army. Mm -hmm. and I would just look at my time, my watch, and I would just go run, and mm -hmm. I could never tell you how long I was running or how fast, but it was just to log some miles. 
I thought a marathon was supposed to be miserable at that point in my life. Hmm. And then when I signed up for my first marathon where I actually wanted to run a certain time and I started adding, adding some structuring, I realized it was more difficult than I, I imagined it would be. But what I was doing wrong was I was trying to run every single race or every single run, excuse right. me, at the pace that I was going to be performing at the marathon. That, that, that's actually logical, right? It's logical if you don't know. And so it's not uh, something where I, 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 I sneer or laugh at it because it makes empiric sense. Like, hey, I need to be able to do in practice every day what I plan on doing on race day. Um, and so I think that this conversation is going to help sort of ease, I think, the fears that people have where if they go out and they run super easy on the easy day that somehow they're taking a step back. Had this conversation with a young man yesterday. Um who runs over a hundred miles a week. Uh, but it was interesting when I found out that he's running most of his easy days at six minutes and 40, six minutes, 45 seconds a mile. Um, but marathon pace is six twenty five, And uh, those two, those two are way, way too close together. Right. Cause when you ran, you averaged six forty four, six forty five pace for your fastest marathon. Most of your easy days were at eight minute pace or slower. Eight, eight thirty. Right. So you have a, a minute and a half. And when I started yep. actually slowing down my runs, that's when I started getting faster because I was, I was actually able to perform at the speed workout days. And it's so incredibly counterintuitive. And I think it's really tough for us to wrap our minds around. And so what I spend a lot of time doing is just telling people, hey, if you're wondering if you're running easy enough, you should be able to speak in full paragraphs your entire run. Not just sentences. Let's go with paragraphs, right? Uh what does that look like? Typically what? 135 to 150 heart rate, that range, 15 beats a minute. Most people between the ages of 25 and 45, they're pretty safe there. We can get into all of the nuanced calculations, but if you're in the 140s, you're probably okay. I think we can agree with that, right? I would agree. Uh, even 130s is really good, right? Uh, but if you start sneaking up into the mid 150s, 160 range on a quote unquote easy run, we probably need to either uh, slow it down or call that run something else. It's something that we're going to call harder than easy. And would anybody ever agree? Let's go do a harder than easy run, <laughs> right? That's what 160 beats a minute is. That's what, you know, running and where you're kind of like, oh, I don't feel so good. You know, if you're there on an easy day, you're probably overrunning it and you're actually going to reap the benefits of slowing it down a bit. Well, I'm, I'm naturally competitive with myself oh, and right. I think that's what was really hard for me in the beginning was, well, yesterday I ran my run at 755 pace. Today I'm not feeling as good, but I need to run better than my 755 pace, mm. even though it's an easy run. And one way I kind of countered this was using a heart rate monitor. So I never trust what my, my watch says. Sure. My watch will say I'm easy run some days. I'm 180 beats per minute. Mm. Right. Mm. But I started wearing a chest strap heart rate monitor. Right. And for me, that was this checks and balance of, okay, today is actually going to be an easy run. I'm not allowing my heart rate to get above 147, 148 beats per minute. Perfect. So it held me accountable to what I was actually trying to achieve for that workout. Yeah. I follow the Maffetone method, which put me below 150 beats per minute. If I was running below 150 beats per minute, I was below my max aerobic heart rate. Right. But I think sometimes people need to implement these systems or checks and balances to hold themselves accountable because it's really easy to compete with yourself. Oh man. Yeah. You know, and then we fall back into the trap of trying to get progress to be linear and um, it can uh, really be. Um, deleterious to, you know, uh, uh, our, our, our efforts um, to get better. You know what? I tell people too, I've been having this discussion about heart rate and heart rate monitors. Let them be your guide, not your governor, right? Uh, let's not ever lose um, what makes us quintessentially human, our ability to feel, right? Our ability to uh, 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 know what pain is versus not. And so <clears throat> we need to know what easy is and you should be able to feel it. 
I asked a guy the other day, would you know the difference between hot and cold? He says, well, yes. I said, do you know the difference between up and down? Well, yes. So, you know, we need to be able to know the difference between hard and easy, right? But the heart rate monitor can be a guide. Uh, that way we can check the data just to make sure that our perception of how hard we're running matches what the physiologic data is telling us. Let it be your governor. Let it be your guide, not your governor per se. In other words, don't be so married to the gadgetry and married to the uh, 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 heart rate monitor that you actually forget to just kind of go, now wait, how do I feel, right? And let's make sure that we are always in touch with ourselves. I'd be curious, you know, now we have so much data available to us. Mm. I mean, I see people wearing three wearables sometimes <laughs> and constantly monitoring data, mm. sleep, performance, recovery, everything. I think there's, there's a, there is a threshold where there's too much data that you're trying to work with. I'd be curious what data you had available to you when you first started running. None. Uh, the data we had available to us was how we felt. Perception. Perception. Right. Uh, it's fascinating to me because I've been telling some people recently, we're the same organism that we were. Uh, in the very first Olympic Games in Athens, Greece in 1896. We're the same organism. Human beings uh, 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 live longer now, right? Because we discovered penicillin, right? But we're the same organism. We were um, 100 years ago, 150 years ago. But our ability to um, be engaged with all of this technology has outstripped our quintessentially human built-in ability to um, value things like delayed gratification, patience. If you think about it, uh, 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 Insta is the prefix to a whole lot of things that we just love, like Instagram, instant messaging. I was telling somebody the other day that we're too lazy to get out of our trucks uh, going to the liquor store and buy whiskey in the state of Texas. There's drive through liquor stores now, right? But we're still the same organism that we were 100 years ago. And so part of running easy also then also uh, 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 sort of clicks that, uh, uh, that switch. It flips the switch. It hits the button that requires us to engage that part of our brains, which is delayed gratification, understanding that this is not instant fitness. We are in a microwave dinner world, and I've been telling a lot of my athletes this, and we are trying to engage in a turkey baking sport, right? We don't want to have TV dinners or microwave dinners on Thanksgiving Day. We want the turkey that takes six, seven, eight hours in the oven, right? Right? So we got to treat our fitness the same way. We cannot microwave fitness. And part of that means slow it down on your easy days because we have to let the human aerobic system do what it does. And it's the same one, right, that our bodies had. Even look at Roger Bannister. He's the first man to ever break four minutes in the mile. Most people have heard of Roger Bannister, right? Roger Bannister is now made fun of in some running circles because his training plan had so much hard, fast running in it and so little volume and so little easy running. We now know that Roger Bannister, who was the first man ever to break four minutes in the mile, probably would have run eight, 10 seconds faster in the mile, right? Had he actually engaged in the processes and understood the science and building a human aerobic system that we actually now know 60, 70 years later. Uh, I believe it was John Walker from New Zealand was the first man to break 350 in the mile. He ran 349. I dare say Bannister probably could have done that too if he had slowed down, did more high-end aerobic work, and less what we refer to as anaerobic work, which is sprinting. It's really interesting. And all of that has to do with our ability to breathe deep, slow it down, engage our brains in the quintessentially human trait of delayed gratification and playing the long game, 
which is something that we're just not very good at because we've kind of short-circuited it in the last 20 years. The iPhone 1 in 2007 is that line of demarcation where our patience was officially thrown out the window. Think of instinct. <laughs> uh, talking about data, actually. I think a lot of people have lost the ability to make decisions based off of instinct or gut or feeling that is subjective because they're so trained to make decisions based off of just subject or objective data. You are damn right. So if I think of my training on a regular week, I can tell when I'm ready or need a speed workout because I start to itch for it. I get tired. And this is, I felt this during ultra prep so much. And this is why I was looking forward to the transition to a marathon prep. My body was just telling me, stop, stop running so slow all the time. Just give me one speed workout a week. That's all we need. If you just give me one speed workout mm-hmm. a week, I will be happy. And my, if you just listen to your body, and a lot of people can't listen to their body. They don't understand what that feels like. It's awareness. When you are aware of your body, you know what it needs. And I can feel when I'm about to, you know, it's a, it's a Monday night, Tuesday morning. I know the next day is a speed workout. I'm itching for it. I want it. And it's like this release. But if you just listen to that instinct that your body is telling you, you can learn a lot about yourself. And it's learned by doing. You know, it's really not unlike a lot of the other things that we do in life that we get better and better at the more we do it. And what uh, uh, I say, which is harping right back on the whole concept of delayed gratification and playing the long game is the more you do it, the more you feel it. And I think so many of my runners, many of whom at this point may be listening to or watching this podcast, they can relate that 10, 12 weeks into it, they chuckle at what uh, seemed difficult or hard or confusing 10, 12 weeks prior. Because once you get in it and you learn by doing, suddenly that instinct, you can start feeling it a lot better. You can feel pace, right? And workouts uh, get screwed up less often, right? Because they don't, they, don't, they don't go out hot and burn out. They start learning by doing. And that instinct that you have, those feelings that you get, if you think about it, that was learning by doing for you that I don't think three years ago that you would be able to sort of regulate your own uh, um, um, uh, feelings and be able to interpret the body's data that it's giving you, um, that you're able to just interpret without having to use gadgetry or wearables to tell you. Absolutely. Hey guys, thanks for checking out the video. And if you enjoyed it, please like the video and subscribe so you don't miss out on any future releases. And if you wanna watch the full episode, go right here and click on the video to my left.